Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Analyst at Tricom Funding. Tricom is pleased to introduce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of this series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our presenter today is John Walters. John is currently the VP of Business Development for Insurance Applications Group, LLC, the company that designed and markets the Essential Staff Care Benefits Program. John was hired eight years ago as a Director of Business Development. And since taking that position, ESC has dramatically increased its client base every year to make Essential Staff Care the largest benefits program for temporary agencies in the nation. Now with over 500 staffing companies as clients and over a half, over a, half a million temporary enrolling annually, ESC has been recognized as one of the fastest growing businesses for Inc. Magazine's 50 slash 5,000 for the last three consecutive years. ESC has also been awarded both the Golden Eagle Award and the Soaring Eagle Awards over the last three years from the National Association on Health Underwriters. In today's Industry Insider webinar, John will discuss the recent new guidance to the healthcare reform look-back rule put forth by the federal government. These changes will drastically change the way employers determine who is considered full-time employees for the purposes of calculating health care reform penalties. By the end of this session, you'll know how these changes will benefit your staffing firm and how you can begin preparing your staffing firm in 2013 for the impending January 2014 effective date. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the chat feature located on the right toolbar and submit questions to all panelists. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to John. Thank you, Amanda. I really appreciate the introduction and, and thanks everyone for attending today. Um, we're going to go through uh, the new look back rule that was just proposed uh, uh, by the IRS uh, a few short weeks ago. Um, uh, again, a little bit, just like Amanda said, uh, about Essential Staff Care, who we are. Um, this is some of the information she mentioned there, uh, but we are an award-winning benefits firm, and we specifically designed this uh, program for temporary employees and the, t and the temporary and staffing industries. Um, general disclaimer here, just for everyone to be aware of, I am not an attorney. I am an insurance professional. So when it comes to the presentation of our interpretation on these current rules and regulations, for the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, if you're concerned about how these uh, uh, regulations may affect your own specific business, um, we ask that you uh, contact your own legal counsel for some advice. Um, today's uh, topics covered, um, the look back rule. Uh, well, we're gonna talk about it, uh, some of the period definitions, uh, employee definitions and considerations, um, and I'll round it out with some examples and suggestions and uh, then summarize everything, okay? From here, um, the look back rule. Originally, the health care reform's definition of full-time employees was simply calculated at whatever employee hit either 30 hours a week or 130 hours in a, any given month. Uh, as uh, the penalties were also calculated monthly, um, this scared a lot of uh, employers, um, uh, and this would have cost the staffing industry uh, billions. Uh, and just to answer your question, um, Amanda, I am on uh, my uh, phone here, and I'm not using the PC speakers. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. All right. Um, the look-back rule was aggressively pursued by the American Staffing Association and a coalition of industries such as the retail, restaurant, and other associations um, just due to the fact that uh, it was uh, uh, a lot more safety in numbers in that respect. Um, let's see here. The look-back rule was uh, formulated to give employers flexibility by permitting them to adopt reasonable procedures to determine which employees are considered full-time without becoming liable for a tax payment, or also to protect those employees from the unnecessary cost, confusion, and disruption of coverage 
uh, and to minimize administrative burdens on the affordable insurance exchanges. All right, the look back rule, basically the look back period, okay, uh, as defined by the IRS, is is uh, called the standard measurement period. Uh, that's also going to be loosely known as the look back period. And um, the standard measurement periods for ongoing employees are chosen by you, the employer but they must be applied in a uniform and consistent basis for all employees in the same categories. Um, the IRS notice that we're referring to actually defines what those categories are. Those categories include union and non-union employees, employees classified based between salaried and hourly, um, could be employees of different entities, and employees located in different states. There are some basic rules that follow the standard measurement or look back periods. Uh, they can be no shorter than three and no longer than 12 consecutive calendar months. Uh, for example, you could use pretty much well up to any 12 month period. Um, you could choose to make that a calendar year, a non-calendar year, or any different 12 month consecutive period, such as one that ends shortly before start of your plan's open enrollment season. Employers will also have to make reasonable determinations um, for both your ongoing and your newly hired employees uh, at the end of each look-back period to determine their full-time status at the end of those measurement periods. All right. If at the end of the look-back period, if the employee is determined to be a full-time employee, during that period, then the employee would be treated as a full-time employee during a subsequent stability period. And this is going to be regardless of the employee's number of hours of service during that stability period, so long as he or she remains an employee. So basically, if you determine those uh, employees to be full-time, they will be considered full-time for the following stability period. And I'll get into those definitions in just a moment. Um, for employees determined to be full-time employee during that measurement period, the following st stability period has to be a period of at least six consecutive calendar months, and that follows the measurement period and is no shorter than the duration of that look-back or measurement period. If the employee were determined not to be a full-time employee at the end of their look-back period, the employer would be permitted to treat the employee as not a full-time employee during that subsequent stability period, all right? But, there, but the rule there is the stability period cannot exceed what the measurement period is, all right? The new IRS notice also uh, has a new definition for a cl new class of employee, the now variable hour employees. And that definition goes as follows. If at the time of hire an employee cannot be reasonably determined to work on average 30 hours a week, or if based on the facts and circumstances at the start date, the period of employment at, at, at more than those 30 hours a week is reasonably expected to be of limited duration, and it cannot be determined that the employee is reasonably expected to work on average at least 30 hours a week over the initial marriage period. In our understanding, this is exactly what a temporary or contract employee will be defined as. Um, uh, to start off on any, pretty much well, any type of contract, uh, but if you cannot reasonably determine that, that they'll be continue working after that contract in, uh, ends, if it's within the 12-month look-back period, then that employee, by definition, will be a variable hour employee. All right, now some of the period definitions. Again, the initial or standard measurement period as defined by the IRS is also going to be known as the look-back period for those newly hired employees. Again, you have the flexibility as employers to choose any period of time as long as it's no shorter than three months and no longer than 12 consecutive calendar months to detract the employee's hours to determine if they're going to be considered full-time for that standard measurement or stability period. Uh, generally, initial measurement periods will uh, will begin on the employee's start date. All right. The subsequent stability period, based on after the reasonable determination of, of whether that employee is going to be treated as full-time or not full-time, again, that stability period for full-time employees must be a period of at least six consecutive calendar months that is no shorter in duration than the initial measurement period, and that must begin immediately after. 
For not full-time employees, the stability period must not be more than one month longer than whatever your initial measurement or look-back period is defined as. All right. You have one more period to consider, and that is what's called the administrative period. Uh, typically, this could also be looked at from a, a plan enrollment, uh, just like their eligibility period or 90-day waiting periods. Is basically the time between that measurement period and the associated stability period to determine which employees are going to be considered full-time and for you to notify and enroll those employees into uh, uh, your health insurance program or consider them for the tax. Uh, the thing about the administrative period is it must neither reduce nor lengthen what the measurement period or stability periods are. And I'll have a good example for that toward the end of our presentation. So basically, for January 1, 2014, there are two types of employees all staffing companies must consider. Number one, who is going to be your ongoing employees or your full-time employees as of January 1, 2014. Then, of course, all your newly hired variable hour employees who will be hitting that reasonable determination throughout the year in 2014. Okay. For your ongoing employees, those are basically your current employees throughout the year, probably starting in January of 2013, who have been employed for at least one standard measurement period or for one full look-back period. These will be the true full-time employees that must be considered for coverage or the penalty beginning on January 1. Your newly hired variable hour employees will be um, their initial measurement or look back period will begin on the date of hire and will continue until that look back period ends and a determination of full time is made. Um, again, these measurement periods will be ongoing as employees are hired. All right. We want to make sure you have some considerations here when, when figuring out what to do with your look back period and when to begin. We're suggesting to all of our clients and to anybody that will listen that employers will want to begin determination of all their measurements, stability, and administrative periods as soon as possible. We're recommending probably, and we think most of our staffing clients are going to be looking at the longest period for a look back uh, period as possible, which is going to be a 12 month, which is as long as you can go. All right, but every company will have to take its own individual circumstances into account when determining what these periods are. We think there is going to have to be some investment in either time or money into tracking of employee hours throughout the measurement period, and this will be critical in determining at least what your estimated tax or your coverage liabilities will end up being. And it's possible that aggressive time management of employees in 2013 may be required for staffing companies to reduce costs. All right? Here's some examples. While we're telling everybody to try to put everything together for you, use January 1 to December 31st of next year, 2013. As, as you're basically your initial measurement or your look back period to determine who is going to be considered your ongoing full-time employees for January 1, 2014. Any newly hired employees that are hired throughout the year in 2013 will continue to be tracked throughout that year for their full 12 calendar months into 2014. Throughout the year of actual 2014, January 1 to December 31st of 2014, this will be the stability period for those ongoing employees as of January 1 that year. Um, a rolling 12 calendar month period will also be the stability period for any of those newly hired full-time employees based on their start date. And, and uh, for a good example of what an administrative period would look like, October 1 of next year, 2013, through December 31st of 2013, could be an example administrative period. You'll use the last three months, basically, of next year to determine who is going to be full-time for January 1, 2014, and who either will or must be offered coverage or considered for the tax. All right. Based on um, you know, our conclusion and summarize everything for everybody, we're telling everyone to immediately start building language into your contracts 
that allow for adjustments, basically some type of contingency clauses, if you haven't already began those, to cover the cost of any federal taxes, fines, or coverage mandates that you're going to be responsible for. Um, we also want everybody to know that we're, we, what we think, we're experiencing a fundamental change in the, in, in the industry here. Employees will no longer be dependent on their employer for their major medical health insurance. That's the, in our mind, that's the whole purpose of what the exchanges are for. We're telling all of our clients to start now to determine how many full-time employees will be considered what are those taxable employees for January 1, 2014. And then whatever those costs are, either for your tax penalties or your coverage mandates, to spread that cost of the tax or the coverages among all employees to remain competitive. And again, aggressive tracking of hours and time management may be needed for employers to reduce those uh, uh, expected costs starting in January 1. All right. We believe that the look-back rule is a good thing, considering the billions of dollars that will be saved by employees, employers across the country based on that previous definition of what full-time employees were in the health care reform law. We think the look-back rule is a very good thing for the staffing and temporary industries. As, as that previous definition, there was a lot of concern and heartache out there that it could have potentially put some smaller or mid-sized employers out of business. We're also telling everyone that um, each employer is just going to have to run their own numbers to see if offering qualified plans to a constantly changing workforce is going to be more or less costly than what paying the penalty is. Uh, everybody's business is different. Everybody uh, has different types of staffing and industries that they go out. Uh, uh, so everybody's going to have to basically run their own numbers. And, of course, that's all assuming that a qualified plan is going to even be available or feasible um, due to basic participation requirements, costs, administration, everything that staffing companies may or may not be familiar with offering for their temporary workforce. Um, the way we're seeing things here is uh, uh, health care has always been on a constant upward track for costs there, and we do not believe that is going to change. All right. Finally, the sources and the materials that we have for everyone. I believe Amanda set up a, uh, 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 the ability for everybody when they logged in to download some supporting documents. What we have for you in the supporting documents is the actual IRS notice 2012-58 that describes the look back rule. Uh, we also gathered a lot of this information from the Department of Health and Human Services. And then one of the other supporting documents that we had in place for everyone was from the National Law Review. The very good synopsis of the 2012-58 uh, IRS notice, and uh, of course it was written by Alden J. Bianchi, who has been on ASA's uh, legal team, so we think that's a very reputable source to use as well. All right. From there, um, if you have any other questions on our, some of our other webinar presentations, we have more of them that has a lot more details on what the VPACA rules are and to download our white papers on health reform, please visit www.eschealthcarereform, all spelled out, dot, uh, dot com. And um, questions can also be submitted to either myself or one of our other executives here at Essential Staff Care um, at uh, www.essentialstaffcare.com. All right, the floor is now open for questions here. Um, and so what we can do is uh, go ahead and start looking through. I've got a lot of uh, chatting going on over here. And let's see here. All right, um, yeah, we did have a lot of questions about um, the PowerPoint slides and the event materials. If you did not download them prior to the event, um, what I can do is I will send out an email to everyone who attended the webinar and provide that information to you again. So everyone will get copies of that information. Um, and then we did have a question that came in. And the question is, what is the penalty now per employee? Is it still like 2K annually? Yes, and, and it is $2,000 if you consider that employee is going to work full-time all throughout the year. 
but the penalty is actually calculated monthly. It's uh, $167.67 per full-time employee per month. So that's why uh, uh, we at Essential Staff Care kind of always preferred to use the monthly uh, uh, penalty for it uh, based on the yearly penalty because, uh, you know, other than probably a small class of employees, very few employees, you know, may actually be working all year long, all 12 months. So we kind of think that was a little bit scarier to folks using the $2,000 number uh, for those full-time employees for the penalty. And uh, I see one here that uh, that's how the definition for full-time employee was 35 hours. Um, that has been uh, a definition in the past, but in regards to health care reform, the definition of full-time employee has always been, uh, you know, 30 hours. They basically uh, average 30 hours a week in any given month, or if they average uh, 130 hours a month. And from a yearly calculation, we're looking at it about 1560 uh, hours for throughout a year. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's see, from uh, Rose here, are you saying that contract to hire employees that are only on our payroll for three months, we would not have to pay the uh, pay insurance or penalty? Based on these new rules for the look back, let's say that's a newly hired employee. Okay. By definition, because you can guarantee, pretty much will guarantee that that contract employee is going to work full time for three months, but you cannot reasonably determine that that employee is either going to take another assignment or you may not have another assignment available to that employee. Well, that pretty much well by definition fits the variable hour employee. All right. Basically, uh, that employee probably would not work uh, a full 12 month period. So you're absolutely right. That person would not be considered for uh, coverage or the tax. Um, if the employee throughout that year does not hit that definition of full time status or a full time employee, then for their stability period, for some reason, if they did work sporadically throughout a 12 month period but never made that uh, month or yearly average, then they're not going to be considered full time for the following stability period. And therefore, no penalty or no coverage would be available for them. Let's see. Uh, from Chuck Carlton, is the penalty assessed on all full time employees or just those who receive a subsidy? Now, yeah, that gets a little bit confusing there, but the um, the penalty for the if employees get the subsidy is if you do offer a qualified major med program to all of your employees. Then assuming one of those employees qualifies for a subsidy, and the only way they can do that is if their premiums exceed 9.5% of their W-2 wages, then that employee will qualify for a subsidy, and then the tax would be $250 per month per employee that qualifies for a subsidy. Again, that's assuming that you're covering your entire full-time workforce with a uh, full-blown uh, MEC-covered program. Okay. Um, from Thomas, uh, any updates on what the exchange coverages will look like? Um, there's been um, actually there's been some information that that has come out on what the various states are looking at, but from a federal standpoint, uh, the only definition that they really have to meet is that the plan meets uh, uh, covers certain uh, qualified. Uh, 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 you know, categories of care, and it must meet a 60% actuarial value. Um, that is the lowest what they define as the the bronze plan. So those that you know, but what they're going for is more like what your typical qualified major med program would look like. Okay, and then I think uh, see some more questions on sending slides to everyone. I believe Amanda's got that covered. Let's see. All right. Um, okay, I'm getting some chat box questions up here as well. I'm sorry I didn't see those. Uh, keeps, all right, I'll start with the last and go up. Um, we have temporary contractors that are long-term and work for periods longer than 12 months. Would we have to now consider them full-time employees? Yes, we do believe anybody that, that is working throughout the year for you in January 2013, basically employees that are on those long-term contracts, that in our mind that meets the definition of a full-time employee. So as of January 1, they either need to be offered coverage or the penalty must be paid on them. Okay. Um, if an employee is hired full-time from the staffing agent 
and a penalty is assessed, will it go back to the staffing agency or the new employer? Um, uh, again, if you're the employer record, this is if this is your W-2 employee, um, you're going to be the one liable for the penalty or the coverage. Uh, I mean, and again, I'm not really sure how they're they're going to plan on doing employee leasing scenarios, but in our mind, it's going to go back to the employer record. See if I can. All right, from Tony Gray. If any employee is not de deemed full time during his look back, then during his stability period, are you continuing to always look back at his last 12 months in the event his work hours increase? Uh, uh, Yes, uh, if an employee is not deemed full-time during his look-back period, he is not going to be treated as full-time for the su subsequent stability period. But once that, that, but the stability period cannot be any longer um, um, than what the look-back period was. So yes, we believe that is going to be the case when it comes to determination uh, of those employees that switch between part-time and full-time. The actual IRS notice uh, uh, has a good. Oh, well, uh, I won't say good examples, but they have some examples of what happens uh, during various situations there. Okay. What if an employee is receiving health benefits but leaves for three months and then comes back? Is this person still eligible? Do we still pay the penalty? Great question. Uh, in our last conversation with, the, uh, with uh, ASA's legal team on this, that is the next definition that they're getting pushed for, is how long does an employee have to be away from their job assignment before they have to go back uh, on a new look-back period or, or considered a new hire again? Um, so that you're, you're in a little bit of a gray area right now with the look-back period, but we expect the definition on that to come back soon, and we'll update everyone once we find out uh, what that is. Okay. Um, what about temporaries who may work for other employees during the year? Doesn't this create a situation where more than one employer could be paying a penalty on the same temp? That is a very good question as well. Um, the only guidance from the IRS on that is the only thing you, the employer, have to base everything on is your own W-2 or the employee's own W-2 wages while they're employed with you. So that's why we tell everybody to think of the penalty in a monthly fashion, especially in this industry there, because if that employee is working for you, um, based on their W-2 wages and their full-time status, uh, you know that's when they're going to be considered there. And if they're with another employee, employer uh, at some point during the year, well, that's that employer's issue to deal with uh, uh, when the employee is working for them. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Cindy. So the health plan is still being written. If if, if what I think you mean there is the health care reform bill still being changed as we speak, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Uh, pretty much well on a daily basis, the IRS, Health and Human Services, or the Department of Labor is issuing a new regulation in regards to the Health Care Reform Act, and uh, it has been difficult at best uh, to try to keep up with everything as it comes out. We also expect a number of changes probably throughout the year of 2013 as well before we really get geared up for 2014. All right, let's see if I can go back. Okay. All right, good question. If you start 2014 with less than full-time, 50, 50 full-time equivalent employees, what is your status for 2014? That is a great question because one of the first calculations employers have to make is whether or not they're deemed what's going to be called either a large or a small employer. A large employer or the uh, large employers are the only ones subjected to the penalties and the requirements of health care reform. And how you figure out if whether or not you're going to be a large or small employer is simply take all hours from uh, internal staff, everybody, all full-time employees and temporary employees, add them all up in any given month and divide it by 120 hours. If that result is over 50 employees, you are considered a large employer and then subjected to the penalties and the regulations. If you are under 50 or under, um, then you're considered a small employer and then you, you are not subjected to the health care reform requirements. Um, that being said, in our experience with the majority of our client base and how they do business, we do expect the majority of staffing firms to be considered uh, large employers. Okay.
Um, let's see. What is the first month that we could be hit with the penalties? Well, the penalties, uh, for in, in our understanding, are all supposed to start on January 1, 2014. So they will be assessing and can calculating the penalties monthly. We, we are not sure at this time how those penalties are going to be collected, whether it be monthly, yearly, or on your quarterly tax returns. Um, our gut instinct and our assumption is that those taxes would be calculated and paid on your quarterlies, but again, there really hasn't been any guidance on how that tax is going to be collected. We're just assuming at this point. Okay. Um, if you have two companies and an individual works through both, do you have to combine those hours as you must in a 401k determination? Um, uh, that is a great question. Um, uh, what I would like is a little bit more clarification from you there, a Angela, if, uh, uh, if the two companies are common owned or if they're two separate companies. Maybe you can email me after this and, I, and we can dive into that a little bit more. Um, Let's see, where do we find the types of health coverage we need to offer to ensure it meets the guidelines? Um, that is going to be probably through your own uh, uh, personal uh, health insurance brokers. Uh, we know a lot of them are scrambling out there to try to determine plans that are going to uh, fit. Um, or you could consider your own internal program that you may or may not, that you may already have in place for your internal staff. So, uh, again, what we're kind of telling all of our clients are, well, we think the look-back rule is going to be a great thing. It's going to minimize that number of full-time employees considering what it could have been. Once every every company runs those numbers, determines who and and how many folks are actually going to be considered full-time as of January 1, 2014, then you would make a decision whether or not you wanted to open up your internal program based on those costs and experiences to that, to that uh, 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 employee class or maybe try to go to some other route. Uh, the essential staff care program is going to be, uh, we don't, we at this time are not getting into the major med business. Um, we don't really, uh, you know, like how things are going in that side uh, of the healthcare market. So we are going to kind of uh, stick with uh, similar plan designs to what we have uh, for those variable hour employees, and we're going to be designing our programs to help out for the first dollar coverage uh, uh, that employees may uh, experience in the exchanges. We think that's going to be, and from a major med standpoint, that's another reason why we're not getting into that business, because kind of the way we're seeing things, we expect most of the growth in that market to be in the state insurance exchanges. Okay. Um, so to confirm, an employee who works 30 to 40 hours per week uh, for nine months won't be considered full-time if the employer uses a 12-month look back, well, which means the employer will not pay the penalty on that employee. That is absolutely correct. That is exactly what the look back rule states, again, assuming you choose a 12-month look back period. But in our mind, why wouldn't a staffing company choose the longest period for look back as possible? All right. Let's see. All right. How will this affect a staffing company that uses a PEO? Very good question there. We have uh, several clients of ours that are actually PEOs, and we know that there is some uh, heartburn, for lack of a better term, on what they're going to be doing. Um, um, We've talked to some PEOs out in California that they're, uh, you know, very much expecting them, the PEO, to be responsible for the penalties and the coverage. So we know that there is a lot of consternation out there uh, from the PEO industry on how this is going to affect them, um, and we know it, we've, it's got a lot of PEOs agitated. But my gut, again, this is just my opinion, is that if the PEO, uh, if the employees are under their FEIN, or, or or they're you know adequately defined as the employer record, they're going to be the ones responsible for the tax or the offering of coverage. Okay, let's see if I missed any questions for anybody. Okay, I'm going back up to the top to see if there's any I missed. Um, let's see. Uh, is there a formula to calculate seasonal employees until a full time number? Now, the IRS actually defines, has a different definition for seasonal employees, and I will refer to you to that IRS notice that we have uh, hosted for the two, uh, IRS notice 2012-58. 
Um, they have a good section in there on what seasonal employees are defined as, which is which is very typical to what it used to be. But they um, uh, those seasonal employees, if they're classified as a true seasonal employee, I'm pretty sure they're not really going to be uh, considered for the tax. Okay. Um, okay. So what if we don't offer insurance for employees? Would there be a penalty? Um, well, yes. Basically, the way the law is, the law is to pay or to play. Um, what we're seeing out there, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are telling you, hey, you must offer the, the coverage, and that's your only choice. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, the way it was designed in Massachusetts, it, it's also a pay-or-play system. Um, what the majority of our staffing clients did in Massachusetts when that law passed, uh, inherently the tax ended up being cheaper than, than what the cost of coverage was. So that's what the majority of our clients in, in that state did. Um, most of the clients we're talking to right now are, are in agreement with the same philosophy. Those are the ones that we've talked to, our, our mid to large size clients that have also went ahead and ran the numbers. Um, it's pretty much well universal that uh, it seems to be the penalty is going to be cheaper than the cost, administration, the uncertainty uh, on the increase of cost year after year, the way health insurance premiums are going. All right. Um, and let's see here if I missed anything. All right. Amanda, do you see any questions I may have missed? or? Um, let's see. I have a question here. So if I have forty or 4,000 hours in a week and you divide it by 120 hours, if that is not over 50, then I don't have to pay the tax? Well, that, that would be 4,000 hours in a month and divide by in a month. In a month. Right. Uh, the 120 hours is yeah, based on the monthly calculation there. So if it's 4,000 4, hours in a month, you divide that by 120 hours. If it's not over 50, then you're you are under a different. You're considered a small employer, and you are not subjected to the health care reform penalties or requirements. Um, actually, um, if you're considered a small employer, you're supposed to be getting certain tax breaks. Um, but in our research, uh, not a whole lot of uh, small employers have been either taken advantage or found some of the tax breaks a little too difficult to apply for. That being said, though, you're not underneath the penalties uh, as a large employer. Okay. Let's see. I just went through a bunch of them and, and grabbed as many as I could, but I'm sure I may have missed, missed something here or there. I see a new one that just came in. Uh, if you offer a high-priced plan and the employee denies or declines coverage, are you subject to the penalty? You're not supposed to be. Uh, if you're offering the coverage and they decline it for whatever reason, they're not supposed to be considered in the tax. The only uh, issue there is when it comes to major med carriers and how they write their uh, coverage offerings. Uh, they usually require some type of participation rate. So, um, you know, uh, for example, somewhere in the 60 to 70 to 75 percent of employee base that is, uh, are supposed to accept that program or they can rescind their coverage. Um, so that's the only issue there when it comes from uh, a staffing industry perspective um, due to the high cost of major med insurance, but more importantly, the participation requirements uh, imposed by the carriers, it always made it very difficult to hit those participation requirements in a staffing environment. That would be the thing you would have to worry about there when it comes to uh, a major med offering. Again, now uh, another thing to keep in mind of that is like uh, uh, on an earlier question, uh, you have to get the premiums for your major med below a certain level of the employee's W-2 wages. Um, that level is 9.5% of the employee's W-2 wages. Um, if their portion of the premium is higher than 9.5%, basically you, the employer, are not contributing enough to make that threshold, then that employee becomes eligible for a subsidy through the uh, state insurance exchanges, and then you're subjected to a penalty of $250 a month on the, any of those employees that get the subsidy. Okay, and that's what that's where I'm going, we're on your high price, high price plan there. Okay. Do overtime hours count in total hours per month calculations? Um, uh, yes. Uh, in our understanding of everything, uh, is hours or hours, regardless of how they're accumulated, overtime or whatever. 
Hours are hours. Okay, I do have another question here. The hours sure. taken to determine large versus small are total hours or just those for employees deemed full-time in the look-back period? It would be total hours. You add up all your part-time, all your temporary staff, everybody, all hours. That's that's what that's the only calculation where they're looking for what's called a full time equivalent, not a not true. They have a new definition or a different definition for full time employee, and that's the only place that a full time equivalent is calculated is is just in that first decision of whether or not you're a large or a small employer. If anyone had any other questions that did not get answered, please go ahead and, and resubmit them or go ahead and put them um, in either the Q&A question or the chat box. Um, should you have any uh, further questions or would like to reach out to John directly, uh, his information is on the screen, so you are welcome to do that. Sure. And uh, I see a couple more questions here, and I'll go ahead and grab those while I have a few minutes. Um, are salaried employees considered 40 hours? Uh, yeah, hours are hours, again. Uh, even though they may be salaried, you're actually going to be tracking uh, their hours there. But when it comes from the look-back rule standard, you know, it gives you a little bit of flexibility, uh, you know, for those employers. Because for your salaried, and, and I'm assuming you're mean, you know, people that are more like internal staff, uh, you know, uh, in that particular aspect you can have a different look back and stability period for those salaried employees uh, versus what you would have for uh, variable hour or other types of employees okay and Angela what about months that contain five weeks uh, the way the definition is is average 30 hours a week in a given month so it's kind of uh, uh, kind of to me it leads me to believe that's regardless of the number of the weeks or that 130 hours in a given month All right. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing any new questions. I'm hoping I haven't fried everybody's brain on that. Um, okay. And, I see and the while we're waiting for, for yeah, while well, we're waiting for any questions, they did go ahead and put up the poll. So if you could give us your feedback on the webinar today, um, and then we'll just wait a few minutes to see if we have any other questions coming in. Yeah, it looks like I finished a little early there because I wanted to give plenty of time for questions. Let's see, from Steve, uh, any ideas as to how to approach clients with this added cost? Uh, uh, the silver lining in all this, Steve, is that every employer, every single industry in the country is in the same boat, even your clients. So, um you know, uh, what I expect to see is, is very much uh, very similar to what happened in the state of Massachusetts. There was a natural uh, uh, increase in inflation there. Uh, everybody's prices sort of went up to, to cover the new taxes and mandates and penalties. And, um, um, you know, yeah, that's just kind of the way we're seeing how things are going there. So that's why we're telling I mean, all of our clients that, hey, we know that the bids and contracts um, that you're working on right now could very well extend past 2014 because there could be a lot of three- or multi-year contracts out there. Um, make sure you have that contingency language already in place on your contracts so once we start getting closer to January 1, 2014, after you finish the year 2013 for your look-back period so you're going to have a good idea uh, toward the end of 2013 13 who those actual full-time employees are going to be then you're going to be able to you know probably adjust rates there again we also take whatever penalties or coverage mandates that you're considering there and spreading that cost amongst all your employees uh, we kind of ran through the numbers on one of our very very large national clients and um, you know with the, you know we ran the numbers based prior to the look back rule and we ran the numbers after the look back rule and you know what they estimated was uh you know as a percentage of their workforce 
that was going to be considered full-time after the look-back rule was about 15% of their workforce versus about 45 to 55% on the previous definition. So according to the previous definition, their cost per hour spread through all of their employees was somewhere around the buck 65 an hour range. Well, now with the new look back rule, that's kind of dropped the cost uh, per hour to about somewhere between 18 to 25 cents per hour. So again, Every uh, employer is going to be different. Everybody has different contracts based, especially those of you employers that have a lot of long-term contract folks. You're the, going to be the ones that, that's going to have a little bit more you know, trouble spreading that cost. But you've got pretty much well uh, you know, uh, the rest of this year. That's why we're telling everybody to start right now. Go ahead and defining what your look back, stability, and administrative periods are. We're kind of recommending that example of using January 1, 2013 to the end of December 31st for that original look back period. And then use the last three months of next year to determine who all is going to be your full-time employees and who's going to be considered ongoing as of January 1. Okay, let's see. Would a, would a funding company be fined the same as a PEO uh, if they don't have the insurance in place? Um, I think it's, uh, again, it's all determined on employer record and, and the FEIN. I don't see how a funding company would be considered the uh, 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 the employer record, uh, you know, like a, like, a, like a PEO might be. Okay, does the look back rule start anew each year? If you have an employee who ha who worked part of the year and didn't meet the full-time definition, but by the middle of next year does, how does that play out? Um, yes, and, and my understanding of the, of the, of the look rule there, once that employee has gone through their initial look back period, and there is a very good section in the IRS notice on, on, on how to deal with that, how to transition that part-time to full-time employee. So I'll actually refer that for the actual uh, uh, um reference on how to do that. But yes, basically during their stability period, their stability period can't be one month longer than their original look back period. And if they're not deemed full time, um, you know, for that stability period, I would assume, and I'm going I'm to make an assumption here, that yes, that kind of starts a look back period for them as well. So if they're full time by the end of their stability period, I would think that will be in consideration for the tax. John, I had another question. Is there okay. anticipation that the look back period is going to be a rule just for 2014 or ongoing after that? Very good question. Um, there is a section in that IRS notice that guarantees that this is the rule throughout the end of 2015. So employers can use this rule as a safe harbor, um, how it currently stands, for at least through the end of 2015. Now, uh, that was actually a question I asked uh, our attorney consultants what happens after 2015. And their feeling on everything was, since employers are probably going to have to invest time, money, and efforts uh, into uh, getting these periods defined, the tracking of these hours for their employees, for basically the cost to employers for putting these systems in place, um, they think it would be very out of character for them to change the rules drastically after 2014, after American uh, businesses have invested in the capabilities to comply with this law. Now, will there be a couple of minor changes? That's yet to be determined, but nobody would expect it, uh, nobody would expect a change after 2015, which to say Harbor grants you, nobody expects any changes that would, you know, make you have to spend all this money all over again because they know they would have uh, some trouble on their hands. Um, Karen, um, let's see. Is there anyone who had devised a software program for the staffing industry to track this? Well, I've been dropping hints out there to folks um, <laughs> that if they haven't started doing this, it might be a great business for a consultant or some software pro program to, to do this to help staffing companies. Um, but I, you know, uh, not to put Tricom on the spot here, spot here, but for those of you that are clients of Tricom, um, I have a feeling they have that capability for you, and, uh, you know, maybe they'll be able to uh, develop something for you in the future. I have another question. So the second look back might actually be for some non-full-time folks, the, the stability period? Yeah, so the second look back might actually be for some non-full-time folks in the stability period. 
Um, well, right. Um, there is a section in the IRS notice that treats um, basically employees transitioning from part-time to full-time and how to cover that. I would uh, refer you to that IRS document uh, 212-58 that uh, uh, Amanda is going to supply to everybody and that they have on their website, uh, the supporting documents. Um, check out that section very closely because, uh, you know, uh, they're going to be the, that's going to be the section on how to deal with that. But I would assume, yes, if somebody was not full-time for their initial full-time, for their initial look-back period, and they are treated as a not full-time uh, employee for the subsequent stability period, then, but that employee pretty much will meet the full-time definition during their stability period, well then, yes, they will be con probably considered full-time for the following stability period. Okay. If a temporary contractor works more than 130 hours per month, some work overtime hours, but the assignment ends before the look-back period, would they still be considered full-time employees? Um, it's based on how you set up your look-back period. If that period, if they hit that full-time definition throughout the 12 months, Okay, um, and and again, the way the IRS is going here is is hours or hours. So let's say they hit the 1,560 hours before the full 12 month period is up. Um, in our understanding, they may actually consider that employee a full time as long as they're still employed after you know the following year. Okay, but the key is whether or not they make that average through the full look back period depending on how long you set it up, again, assuming a, assuming a 12-month look-back period. Okay. Another question. So full-time equivalent is not a problem if the employee doesn't go over 30 hours per week during the 12-month look-back? For classification of full-time, yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, they either got to hit that 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month for the for the full 12 months to be deemed full time or not full time. All right, because this is what that new definition of variable hour employee. You know, uh, this definition was was hand designed for the staffing industry. Okay, um, because no matter how long that contract, again, assuming it's not a full year 12 month contract. All right. There is no way a staffing company, uh, an employer, can de reasonably determine that if that contract is anything less than 12 months, that you can reasonably determine that employee is going to continue working after that contract is over with, or that there will be a new assignment available for that employee. All right. And then uh, I want to make sure I understand to figure out if I'm a large employer. Uh, I take 120 and divide it by the hours worked. Uh, by the week or the month of all employees. It'll be uh, the 120 hours for the month, and it'll be for all employers, employees. So just take your internal staff, take uh, all of their hours, take all your part-time or, or, or temporary staff, add up all those hours in a, in, a, in, a, in a given month, divide it by 120. If that's 51 or greater, you are a large employer. If that's uh, 50 or under, you are a small employer. I think that answers the, the bottom line example question here. Um, if my company is below 6,000 hours per month, which divided by 120 equals 50 employees, my company is a company that is not included in this cost insurance new plan, nor liable. Okay, I'm, I'm, that's a little long. I'd like to read that question. I don't see it on my chat box. Yeah, you see uh, that one. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really see that question, Amanda. Could you read it to me again, please? Oh, sure. Um, so, so there's a bottom line example. If my company is below 6,000 hours per month, which divided by 120 equals 50 employees, That's right. my company is a small company and not included in the cost insurance new plan nor Absolutely liable. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Okay. You're not subjected to the health care reform laws if you are 50 employees or less. Okay, and then okay. we have another question here about vacations. Do you see that one? Yeah, I do see that one. How do vacations figure into the full-time status if an uh, employee takes one or two weeks a year and one works 40 hours a week or two works enough to be considered full-time but falls below due to the vacations? 
In other words, does it have to be 52 weeks full time? Um, no, I, I do not think so, and I'm pretty sure they're not really going to be counting vacation time and, and paid time off, things of that nature. Um, so it is just going to be uh, those basic hours, uh, you know, uh, through the look back period. Um, basically, if they average that 30 hours a week uh, for all 12 months. Um, I'm, I'm sure that will probably include, you know, vacation and paid time off and those hours as well. Um, and then the, the follow-up question is unpaid vacations. Well, again, you know, I'll assume that would not have hours attached to it, so unpaid vacations, whatever those hours were, wouldn't be part of the calculation, I wouldn't. Okay, another question here. Um, if, as an employer, I can only offer work to my staff for nine months each year, will that prevent me from using the 12-month look-back period? No, in my mind, is that's exactly why you would want a 12-month look-back period. That would severely minimize the number of full-time employees that you'd have to worry about either covering, covering or paying the tax on. Okay, I mean, employers you, if, don't have... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you do want to consider them full-time employees and simply make your look back look back and stability periods uh, nine months. Okay. Another question. Employers don't have to count the first 30 employees when determining whether or not required to pay penalty. Is that Absolutely. the same Absolutely. role as the look back? Absolutely. Whoever asked that question has been doing their best to keep on top of the law and the regulations. That is absolutely correct. Uh, again, when you're uh, doing your calculations for once you figure out who your full-time employees that you're going to be responsible for as, as of January 1, you will deduct the first 30 from uh, the tax penalty. So uh, that was written in the law for originally. That has not changed. So whoever asked that question, they deserve a gold star because they know uh, they've been following the law. <laughs> Great. Um, another question, would we be liable if the PEO closed its door this year or next year? Hmm. Now that's a tricky question. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, again, if, if they're closing their doors this year or next year, um, in my mind, that's prior to January 1, 2014. So it's going to be basically who the employer record is for those employees as of January 1, 2014. That would be the way I, I would kind of answer that. But in that situation, I would certainly seek the advice uh, of, of uh, legal counsel, just to be sure. Great. If an employee works over 1,560 hours in a 10-month period but doesn't work for the last two months of the 12-month look-back period, is that person full-time? Uh, again, based on the notice uh, and how it defines full-time status, it's basically the number of hours. So in that situation, if they hit that 15, 60 hours in a given year um, and that employee continues to be an employee, okay, um, they, doesn't, they don't work that last two months, but they come back January 1. Uh, let's just make an easy example here. Next year, starting that employee starts a new contract January 1. At 10 months in, that contract's over, but he's coming back to work January 1, 2014 for another 10-month contract. I would probably consider, because that employee hit 1,560 hours in that 10-month period and is still an employee January 1 the following year, I would consider that person full-time. Okay, I believe I heard you mention the employer mandate and taxes applied to a PO in the case of a firm using one. How certain you are you of this? I'm assuming it's implied the mandate applies to PEO clients. It depends on the PEO and how they have their contracts set up. Okay, uh, from an you know an insurance company standpoint. You know, let's say we're writing a, a policy for a one of the PEOs as a client. Okay, uh, or or you know one of the clients of the PEO. Uh, the way we write our insurance policies, we attach the policy to the FEIN. So we would always actually have that policy go to the PEO and the actual client, even though their employees are the ones getting the benefits. Um, you know, isn't the policy owner? Okay, 
we've seen situations where where in a PEO it is a co-employment agreement, okay, and, and the PEO is not defined as the employer record. In these, uh, I believe there is a special uh, a dispensation for co-employers uh, on this. I want to double check on that. Again, this question is referred to the PEOs that we have as clients where they're listed as the employer record and not really the, uh, as a co-employer from an insurance policy standpoint. Um, seen writings that imply the mandate applies to the PEO client. Well, the mandate actually applies to all employers, but you know, again, like you said, the PEO gets a little bit tricky. And what we have, what we're seeing from an, uh, you know, just an anecdotal evidence standpoint, is that the PEOs that we're talking to are sweating a lot trying to either get a plan in pay, place or figuring out what to do about increasing rates. So it seems to me that the PEO is taking the responsibility of the mandate. All right, and I would assume that may be in in, in regards to co-employment agreements, but um, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, Tony, if you wouldn't mind, email me after this. I'm gonna do some digging, and I want to see if I can you know get that question answered more accurately for you. Because at this point, from our clients and some of the PEOs we've talked to out there in the industry, we're kind of seeing it going a little bit of both ways there. I do have another question. Sure. What is the current plan and or your guess when it comes to participation rates with staff and temps? Well, that's always been, in our experience, one of the hardest things about getting a you know full-blown group major med health insurance program in a in a temporary contract environment. Now, again, when I'm speaking, you know, staffing industry, you know, probably about 75% of our clients are light industrial and clerical. That's not going to apply to say professional IT or some other type of, uh, say, a boutique, for lack of a better term, staffing company that employs higher paid employees uh, that with a much lower turnover rate. Okay. But from our industry, you know, standpoint, you know, uh, the, the majority of staffing clients we have as clients generally have anywhere of that 200 to 400 percent turnover rate. Light industrial clerical, um, the turnover has gone down a little bit uh, over the past few years, we think, due to the recession, you know, but the turnover is still high uh, based on a traditional type of business, uh, for lack of a better term. Problems there when it comes to offering major med coverage has always been, you know, uh, uh, several different things. Primarily is cost, okay? Um, it was very hard to kick in enough uh, as an employer contribution from the employer standpoint. And the reason the employers, the cost was so high there was due to uh, insurance uh, carriers having participation requirements. Okay, and those participation requirements generally anywhere from the 50. We've seen it as low as 50, but we've seen it on traditionally on average, or probably closer to the 70, 75 percent participation rate. All right, that was extremely difficult for high turnover employees uh, to be able to get a plan um, uh, in place in a staffing environment due to those participation requirements. Um, uh, temporary employees aren't the best risk for carriers. You're basically talking about an employee population that there's not a whole lot of claims history on. Um, and insurance carriers typically like when it comes to major med programs, they're looking at uh, employees that have been uh, in a stable job on average for about three years, not in the staffing industry where the average tenure is three months. So from a risk standpoint, from a cost standpoint, and, and very much so from a participation standpoint, um, it's been difficult to get major med programs into you know staffing and temporary uh, industries. Um, with the healthcare reform law, we don't think that's gotten any easier. Um, uh, we think, uh, if anything, that's going to continue to drive premiums up, if not at a faster rate, certainly at the rate that premiums have been going up. Uh, our own internal company just got our renewal for our major med program, and it was a 25% rate increase. Um, you know, that was pretty substantial, but uh, unfortunately, it wasn't uncommon. So um, 
that's kind of been the difficulties historically. We don't think the health care, in our opinion as a company, we don't think the health care reform law has made that any easier. We don't believe it certainly made it any cheaper to offer a program. Um, but uh, we know there's some people out there that's, that's trying to come up with different various ways. We just don't really know how – in our mind, we, we've been doing this for decades. We probably have 100 years' experience with everybody here, uh, you know, in our organization uh, in the insurance uh, industry. Um, we've been uh, specializing in the staffing industry for um, over the, uh, since the past decade. That's why we're kind of not going the major med route. Um, you know, we just we kind of know uh, historically what the problems were been, have been, and we, based on all the rules, regulations, and how this law affects carriers. We think that's become, in our opinion, has become harder, not easier, uh, to be able to offer those coverages. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have anything else there? Uh, we do have a question about getting a copy of the questions and answers along with today's slides. And again, I will email um, everyone after the webinar, um, either today or tomorrow, due to the high volume of participants. Um, it may take just a little longer to get everyone the information. But we're going to email you the um, two documents that John has provided us, um, some great resource, resources for you, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And then the recording of the webinar will be available on our website. And I can also provide you a link to it when we send out the email. So you'd be able to reference um, and go back to the webinar if you had any questions. And certainly, um, please take down you know, John's information. They're a great resource. Um, should you have any other questions um, that you know anyone here can can help you with. So, with that, um, it looks like we've um, taken care of it. And you now we went over um, just a little bit. So I'd like to thank you all for participating in today's webinar, um, for having some really great questions and discussions. Um, as well as John for sharing his wealth and knowledge about the Look Back Rule. Um, the, again, the recording of the webinar will be on our website, which is at www.tricom.com slash resources, and it will also be available. Um, I will send you a link in the email that we send. If you have any questions um, or like any additional information, reach out to either myself or John. Thank you again for your participation, and watch for information on our next session next month. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you, everyone.